Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. But we're in a period in the Bible called the times of the Gentiles. They started with Nebuchadnezzar and they don't finish until the Antichrist is taken care of by the second coming of Jesus Christ. So we're in a period of time that the scripture calls the times of the Gentiles, the times of Gentile dominion. The book of Daniel deals a great deal with that, especially in Daniel 2 and 7, 8. So we're in that period of time, not only in terms of the time period, but even in the language, in the sense that Zechariah, even this data that I say, in, in, it gives that frame of reference. So we're going to discover that Zechariah's visions cover the period from this rebuilding of the temple all the way to the second coming of Christ when Israel will be restored and so forth. And it's a, the sweep of this is staggering. And we need to keep that in mind because each of the prophecies you may see might have some local historical fulfillment, but it's trivial compared to what's really at issue here, and that's the whole sweep. And you need to get a sense of that and check it out for yourself. Now, in this coming vision, in chapter 3, we're going to encounter Joshua. Don't confuse this with the Joshua that... Um, took the leadership after Moses died to lead Israel into, the, uh, into Canaan in the uh, exploits, of course, of the book of Joshua and following. Joshua there was uh, one of the two spies that reconnoitered the land 40 years earlier, the only two of the 12 that gave a favorable report. They were the only two of the entire generation that didn't die before the end of the land as God committed. So a very interesting guy, but don't confuse him with this Joshua. This Joshua is obviously living at roughly 5th century B.C. He's the one that's serving as high priest of Israel at this time. Now we're going to encounter Joshua in this vision. This isn't happening in a, in a sense of, of, of the time. It's a vision that Zechariah sees, but Joshua is a participant. He's in this vision. And to understand this vision, let me highlight a few things. Now see, you understand the Joshua, that his, the historical Joshua there in Zechariah's time had served as high priest for about 16 years. He was the high priest when they returned from Babylon. They came to start rebuilding the temple. He was the high priest from that time. For 16 years he served as the high priest. And you can find this in Ezra 4. You'll also find Haggai and, and uh, other references to him. We'll, we'll encounter him again in, Zechariah, in the 6th chapter of Zechariah. But um, you're going to find Zechariah, the Joshua in this vision, not in a sense of the, hist the, the literal Joshua of that time, but as a figure of something else. And as we try to struggle to try to understand what is Joshua in the vision supposed to be, he's a high priest, and some interesting things are going to happen. Remember what his name is. If it was Hellenized, it would be Jesus. Yehoshua is Yahweh saves, or Jehovah Ye saves, is what the word means. You may recall that was exactly what Mary was told, that her child was to be named Jesus, because it was Hellenized. For he will what? Save his people from his sins. So it's Yahweh saves is what the name means. That's what the name Yehoshua means. Yeshua is a, another uh, variant of it. Or Jesus in the, in the, Anglo in the Hellenized uh, version of it. Same name. So we have one of the reasons the book of Joshua back in the Old Testament, the time of the, before the judges, is so interesting to us is to realize there's a book in the Bible which is named, in effect, after Jesus himself. Now it's a historical Joshua, but we discover as you study the book of Joshua, it turns out to be a model of something yet future. Yes, there was a Joshua that took from the leadership of Moses, and yes, he led the children to the promised land. But the more you study the book of Joshua, the book in the Old Testament, the more it will blow your mind because you discover it's a model of the book of Revelation. Where another Yehoshua leads his people to dispossess the usurpers of the land. In Joshua is Israel in the land of Canaan. In Revelation, it's the whole people of God is taking the usurper off the planet Earth. The decimal point's been moved over in a sense. So we study the book of Joshua in the Old Testament that way, conscious of the fact that nothing in the Scripture is by accident. The great discovery you have before you, if you haven't made it, is that every detail is there by design. That all of these books, all 66 of them, although penned by 40 different guys, are an integrated package. Every number, every place, every detail is there by supernatural engineering. In spite of the fact it was assembled over thousands of years. So as you realize that, it'll suddenly lift the fog on so many passages that don't seem to make any sense. 
And by the way, a little trick, or a, not a trick, that's a wrong term, um, a key or a, a, an opportunity. When you can counter a passage that doesn't seem to make any sense at all. First thing you should do is, of course, pray about it because the, uh, Jesus has committed the Holy Spirit to teach you most things. No, all things, right on. And one way you can test that, when you find some ordinance in the Old Testament or some strange practice that seems to be described, try putting Jesus Christ right in the middle of that and see what happens. And you'll be amazed what happens. Jesus said, the volume of the book is written of me. That's quite a statement for our Lord to make. The volume of the book. What book? Really, these 66 books. Challenge that. Try it. It's amazing. So as we get into this Joshua the high priest, we have again... Again, we have a Yehoshua in the role of what? High priest. And so some interesting things are going to be going on. Now, one of the key issues that you and I are going to hit head on tonight. Now, we're going to discover four major sections in this chapter. And each one is going to portray, at least idiomatically, our Lord Jesus Christ, our Yehoshua, as our high priest. Who's our high priest? Jesus Jesus Christ, indeed. But he's going to intervene for us. And that's the first two verses are going to deal with his intervening for us as a high priest. Let's jump into Zechariah chapter 3 verse 1. And Zechariah, he says, his first word is and. Now you say, oh come on Chuck, you're going to do that to me. No, I just want to point out that these visions are connected by a wow consecutive. It's a Hebrew technique that they're part of a chain. This doesn't stand on its own. It's part of what went on before. The chapter divisions were added in the 13th, 14th century. They're man's divisions for convenience. And one of the things you want to do as you learn in your Bible is don't take the chapter or verse divisions too seriously. Some of them are in very awkward places. So the and there is an important word because it should alert you to the fact that this somehow connects to what happened we talked about last time. We talked about the, the rider on the red horse and the myrtle trees, which was none other than the Lord, getting his reconnoitering. And he gets on to that. And then we had the four horns and the four craftsmen. We talked about that last time. This is connected to that. The four horns being the nations that had scattered Israel. But God has his agencies to put them down. Now we have this interesting thing in chapter 3. Zechariah says, And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. And there's another character in, this, in the plot here. And Satan standing at his right hand to help him, right? No, (laughs) right, okay, to resist him. He showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Now, this, uh, as I said, Yehoshua means uh, 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 Yahweh saves or Yehovah saves. And, of course, we're reminded in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, Jesus says, He shall save His people from their sins. That's why He's named Jesus. And, of course, I'm going to suggest to you, we're going to discover that Joshua here, standing as a high priest, is ministering in the sense he's standing in the place of his people. We're going to discover, we're going to talk about his sin a little bit in a few verses. It's not his personal sin that's at issue. Many commentators somehow get hung up with some of his frailties. The passage is silent about Joshua's personal sin here. I'm not saying he's sinless, but that's not the issue. He is there as high priest. What does the high priest do? Stand in the place of the people that he represents. And here, of course, he's representing the, the nation Israel. And I think we're going to discover by the sweep of this, it's not an extension to sort of visualize him standing for God's people. And guess how many of you are God's people? Can I see a show of hands? Well, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good percentage. That's great. Okay, good. And he says he saw Satan. He saw Satan. Satan is not some kind of idealized concept of evil. He's not some kind of force, the dark side or something. He is a person. He is a created being. He is real. To use a, perhaps a clumsy rhetoric here, he rattles when you shake him. I mean, he's there. He's tangible. A very powerful And he does not have your best interests at heart. I thought I'd add that, just so there's no confusion. Now, he's on the attack. What's his basis for the attack? Anytime. Do you feel oppressed by Satan? What's his access to you? One way only. Sin. Sin. He can get at you because, you and me, because of our sin. That's his avenue. That's his opportunity. 
Now it says here that Satan was there to resist him. There's a paranomasia here, a play on words, because what it really says, he is there to Satanize him. That's a little clumsy, but the same Hebrew root of resisting him is the same word from which the word Satan comes to accuse or resist or oppose, in a sense. See, it's because of our sin. That's why we need an advocate. Because he's attacking us because of our sin, we need an advocate to protect us. He's the, so to speak, the prosecutor. We need a defense counsel, to use our vernacular. And uh, we need to remember that one of his titles, it's mentioned in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. We have a lot of ground to cover, so I won't try to track each one of these down. We'll track down a few. As uh, Revelation 12 deals with Satan's attack on the woman, which I believe there is Israel. That's a whole other thing, but... He is the accuser of the brethren. He's the accuser of the brethren. That's one of his labels in the scripture. Get down to verse 2. We're making great progress. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now, this little chapter is only ten verses, but it's interesting. It is rich with allusions. And you have the same problem with Zechariah that you have with the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is cryptic or enigmatic to most of us because it indulges in allusions from the Scripture that the writer assumes you know. The book of Revelation, for example, is 404 verses that happen to include 800 allusions from the Old Testament. So no wonder it's a little puzzling to us because most of us haven't done our homework. Zechariah is similar. Here we have a handful of things here in uh, verse 2. The Lord said unto Satan, The Lord... Gee, there's two lords here, aren't there? You want evidence of the Trinity? Here's two of them. Evidence of the Trinity in the Old Testament? Here's a couple of them. The Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath done what? Chosen Jerusalem. Chosen Jerusalem. We're fond of quoting a scripture that the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. That's out of of, uh, Romans. How many have heard that phrase? The gifts and calling of God are not repentance. And we use that for lots of New Testament kinds of things. But that's not what the verse points to. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance refers, we'll look at it later in this chapter, refers to Israel. Not spiritual gifts, although I think, it, don't misunderstand me, it does apply to spiritual gifts for you and I. I'm not going to get into that one right now. But the point of what that's directly, denotatively focusing on is Israel. And here, the Lord says to Satan, the Lord rebuke thee, Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem. See, the ba- what's the basis of Satan's rebuke? That Joshua is innocent? He's attacking because of sin. He's being rebuked not because he's going to deal with how it got taken care of, but he rebukes Satan. Why? Because this guy, this, this, just Joshua, whatever he represents, is chosen. God doesn't unchoose what he's chosen. Well, the first point, by the way, we have two persons of the Trinity in this verse. Do you know the same thing occurs in Psalm 110? The Lord said to my Lord. You know, you have the, now you say, gee, that's a little confusing. No kidding. It is so confusing, Jesus used it to confuse the Pharisees. And I love this. Let's just, do, let's just take the moment to poke at this a little bit. Turn to Matthew 22. I want you to see our advocate in action. You know, if you're a hiring attorney, it's fun to go to a courtroom and see what he... How does he operate under pressure, you know? What kind of a guy have we... Uh, God on our side here. How does he operate? Well, he's he's fun. He is really fun. Matthew chapter 22. And we want about, we'll pick it up about verse 41. And you'll find this in uh, in, uh, Mark 12 and Luke 20 also, but I'll just take the Matthew account. Verse 41. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? He's giving them a little exam. What thank you of Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, in other words. Whose son is he? They said unto him, the son of David. Verse 43. And Jesus said unto them, how then doth David in the spirit call him Lord? See, how can he call him Lord if he's a son of David? See, how can he call him Lord? Saying, quote, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how can he be his son? 
You see, Jesus is asking the Pharisees this question. And I love verse 46. I love verse 46. And no man was able to answer him a word. And here's the part I like. Neither dared any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. <laughs> but he's quoting Psalm 110. And it's the same issue in that psalm. And you'll find it all through the Old Testament. You'll find the Trinity in the Old Testament in many, many ways. In this case, we have two of the three persons manifest there. So much for that. Let's keep moving. Now, the other phrase is, the Lord rebuke you. This is, should remind you in your mind's eye of the ninth verse of the book of Jude. Just before the book of Revelation, there's a little one-chapter book called the book of Jude. And in that book, the book of Jude, and this is a time I won't go into detail, but I think it's interesting to notice just this. Jude is full of allusions to things that you may not know about, so it's confusing. Because Jude is assuming his readers know certain background. And there is an incident that he expects you to know about where Satan was fighting over the body of Moses. Now, you can't find that in the Scripture. You can search the Torah. You, can search, you won't find any competent source for this. There's some allusions to it in the Apocrypha, but nothing competent. It's just something that apparently, in that day, people somehow were taught and knew about. But Jude happens to allude to a situation where Michael and Satan are fighting over the body of Moses. No, it's not, not, it's not Michael and Christ. Christ is the one that created Satan. They're not equal. Satan was a cherub. You, you, you send a tank after a tank. You got Michael after Satan. That, that's, you know, an interesting uh, situation. Now, why are they fighting over the body of Moses? The libraries are full of speculations. I don't want to get in that here. The point is, though, Jude is making a very strange point. The point he's trying to make is that we should not speak evil of dignitaries. Well, let me say, gee, I, I agree with that. But he, Jude picks the strangest, most bizarre example. He says, we shouldn't speak evil of dignities. And he uses as an example, when Michael was fighting with Satan over the body of Moses, he didn't bring railing accusations against him, Satan. He said, the Lord rebuke you. Now you say, okay, here's Satan evil, all this, uh, you know, we, I think we understand that. We are not to bring railing accusations against him, let the Lord deal with it. Don't fall into the trap of speaking evil against dignities, and he is strangely, strange example. Some sobering lessons there. And uh, the Lord rebuke thee is a very key phrase from Jude 9. And uh, in the book of Jude, we find, he th- I think he had Zechariah on his mind anyway, because he used that phrase. But he also, in verse 23, speaks of fire and garments. Both are prominent in this passage, as we'll shortly find out. Now, the Lord rebuke thee is twice in this verse. And another principle, not a big deal here, but I want to call it to your attention. Things are often repeated twice. It's a form of Hebrew construction to emphasize. And we find that in Genesis 14, Ecclesiastes 7. We also find it twice in Revelation, speaking of Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Now, the book of Revelation is, of course, New Testament is written in Greek. But many experts believe it was originally written in Hebrew and translated into Greek because the thought structures are Hebrew, not Greek. And this is an example of that. That uh, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. You remember that from Revelation 14, Revelation uh, 18. And uh, that's a strange construction for us. But in Hebrew, it's common. You sort of say it twice for emphasis. Now, we're going to start talking about sin. It's not Joshua's personal sin, it's Jerusalem's. We'll discover when we get to verse 9, he was there representing the people. He's a figurehead, so to speak, a representative of the people. And so we want to pay a lot of attention here. Now, the most remarkable aspect of God's dealing with Joshua is the basis upon which he brings to naught the accusations of Satan. When you're standing before the throne, the basis of God's advocacy for you is not your merit. Thank goodness. Never do you pray for justice. We're not interested in justice. The basis here is very interesting. It's not because Satan's claims were baseless. Satan's implied claims against the people that Joshua's representing were not without basis. The basis of his, them being excused was not their suffering, albeit they have been a suffering people. That's not the basis. It's not the basis that they promised to do better. You know, that's got nothing to do with anything here. 
You and I can say, gee, we probably, maybe, they, they got, you know, maybe, maybe God excused them because in the future they're going to try to do better. No, 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 no. His claims were valid. It had nothing to do with their suffering. It had nothing to do with their commitment in the future better. It was based entirely on God's sovereign choice in grace. Now you say that's a very New Testament concept. No, God changes not. That's his basis in the Old Testament too. You just have to recognize it when you see it. And of course this is amplified in Romans chapter 9, Romans chapter 11, and other passages. So we'll just keep, uh, let's just keep moving here. He speaks of them as a brand plucked out of the fire. And some scholars figure, well, they've just just come out of captivity in Babylon. So the brand, you know, the nation is like a brand pulled out of the fire. Just before it's consumed, they're pulled out of there. I think as we understand the sweep of these visions, it's not referring just to Babylon, which is what they've just been pulled out of. It's a broader vision. You'll see in a minute. It is them being pulled out of the trauma, not just of Babylon, but of the whole world diaspora. And the troubles are going through now. The day will come when God is going to pull them out of all the, all the trauma they're in now. And we see it here and as an allusion to Israel. Is it not a brand plucked out of the fire? Is it not one that deserves to be consumed but isn't by what? By his sovereign grace. And that's going to get clearer here as we go. This idea of fire, by the way, is uh, another thing that is interesting in the scripture. We find fire all through the scripture. We find it, of course, in the uh, offering of Isaac. Fire that Isaac carries up the hill, the burning bush we just mentioned. The giving of the law in Exodus 19 is characterized again by fire. The rearing of the tabernacle in Numbers 9. And the wilderness journeys with the pillar of fire. We see the fire idiomatically used all through the scripture. And uh, So now we get to another section. Again, Christ is our high priest. I'm going to suggest he cleanses us. He cleanses us. Joshua is in need of cleansing. God has defended him because of his sovereign choice. But now we're going to discover something else, and this may disturb most of you. Anyone's not disturbed by the next few verses, wasn't paying attention by the time we're through. Verse 3 reads as follows. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. Standing before the angel is represent, standing before, just like an attorney is, standing before the court, representing the people. But he's there with filthy garments. The model here that's probably analogous is what happens at Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement. That's when the high priest, that was the only day the high priest was allowed to enter the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies, the innermost sanctum of the temple. You had the, obviously, the, you know, the court, the pillars, you go in, there's the holy place with the the menorah, the seven branch candlestick. We'll talk about that next chapter. And you had the table of showbread over here. And you came up to the veil that separated the Holy of Holies. Just outside of which, but associated with it, was the golden altar of incense. But then behind the veil we have the Ark of the Covenant and, and uh, the mercy seat and all of that. Under penalty of death, you didn't touch the Ark of the Covenant unless it was exactly by the procedure to describe the Torah. David learned that the hard way. Bringing the Ark up to Jerusalem on a cart. And it started to tip over, and one guy put his hand up to keep it from falling over, and God struck him dead. And David was shook. God reads the fine print. (laughs) The procedure was it was supposed to come up on the on the shoulders of the Levites. David gave offerings, and they did it right from that point on, and it's an interesting lesson. God means what he says and says what he means. In any case, on Yom Kippur was the only time that the high priest was allowed to enter the Holy of Holies. And then only after an elaborate ritual of cleansing and changes and liniment. I won't go through all that. It's all in the Torah in detail. And by the way, the rabbinical literature tells us that they tied a rope around his ankle. Should he go in there and somehow not perform it precisely, he would die. And nobody could go in after him. Because nobody was allowed in there except the high priest and only after all the stuff. So they tied a rope to his ankle, so in case, and he had a little bell. So as long as that bell was, they, they, everything's okay. I mean, you get the picture. This is sort of what's going on here. Joshua, the high priest, is standing before the throne, in effect, impersonating, if I can use that phrase, Israel. God had chosen him, the scripture says. In effect, the analogy is God has chosen Israel. That's their advantage. And boy, is that an advantage. Now, I want to talk a little bit about this term, filthy. This is one of those terms that doesn't quite get the message across. 
And I, I want to deal with this a little bit. The word in the Hebrew is a little more graphic. And I'd like to handle this as delicately as I can. But I don't know how you handle this subject delicately. Let me use the translation excrement bespattered. The Mr. translation, he was covered with crap. Okay. <laughs> now, he wasn't just vilely dirty. He was offensively smelly, is what the term means. Now you say, gee, Chuck, where are you getting all that stuff? The word it's tzoa, it comes from the root yatza, which means to go forth or come out or to be evacuated. You getting the picture? With the root, you can get the, uh, you get the picture. Chuck, why are you getting into this? Because that's us. That's us. With all our achievements, with all of our dedicated faithful service, fill in the blank. You name it anything you like. We are, when standing before the throne of God, covered with, fill in that blank. You can do it better than I can. That's us. And if that doesn't offend you, you haven't been paying attention. When we stand before God, we need to realize that as far as He's concerned, our garments, and the word garment, another thing about garments, I didn't set the background here, but the word garment, both in that culture but also in the language, refers to our character, our attributes, what we are. The garments in those days carried your rank on the hem. In our culture, we have it on the sleeve, like stripes on the sleeve for rank, and on the collar for certain military. But ranks, like an airline pilot, how, how senior is you? You can tell by their, you know, the stripes on a sleeve or whatever, or, or a military uh, or a naval uh, commander or whatever. In that culture, that was carried on the hem of the garment. You need to understand that, or you won't understand what it was all about when David cut off the hem of Saul and took off his genealogy. And he later regretted it, asked forgiveness for it. Uh, When the woman pushes through the crowd to touch the hem of the Lord's garment, that she would be healed. Why the hem? Because that was in their mind. That's where his authority was focused. The garment in the scripture represents our worth. And we all have quoted Isaiah 64, 6. Our righteousness is as what? <laughs> Filthy rags. The Hebrew implies used menstrual cloths. Aren't we proud of that? And you think that's offensive when you go through Isaiah. When you get to Zechariah, it's even more graphic. And you say, gee, Chuck, you seem to be dwelling on this. I intend to because I think you and I need to recognize it's not that we're sort of inadequate. It's not that we're just a little tattered. We have a foul smell before the throne. And we need to understand that what was true of Joshua there in this vision, representing Israel, is also true of you and I. Now we could go on this idea of garments, of course, is in Isaiah 64, 6, Proverbs 30, 12, Jude 23, Revelation 7, 14. It goes all through. You can do a study through Scripture. It's, pretty, it's consistently used. Now it's interesting that Joshua, in this whole procedure here, is silent. Joshua is in the role of representing the people. You know, it's fascinating. I've been studying a little bit the six trials of Jesus Christ in the Gospels. He went through six trials. From Gethsemane to the cross, there were six trials, actually, if you analyze it all. Many people are fascinated that before, say, Pilate or whoever, he makes no defense. That's exactly what the prophecy said in Isaiah 53. He has a lamb before his shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He's innocent, everybody says, right? Satan said so. Through Judas, he says, I have betrayed innocent blood. He's innocent. But he's before Pilate, and the others too, and made no defense. Do you know Why? He couldn't because he was in our shoes. He was bearing whose guilt? Ours. We have no defense. Verse 4. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. 
And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. This is the angel of the Lord. Who is it? Jesus Christ. How do I know? Lots of reasons, but if nothing else, he is in effect forgiving sin. Angels don't do that. Not normal angels, I mean. This is none other than the second person of the Trinity in this verse. And he said, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he says, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee. Praise God. I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. Now you and I, as Joshua, cannot stand before a holy God with the filthy garments that we have on. And of course this is emblematic of taking away sin. Romans 3 is a good example. Many verses. I won't even start on that one. They'll be all in the notes if you want to get into it. Where's the first occasion this happened? Where's the first occasion in the scripture? Answer, Genesis 3. Adam and Eve, having fallen, tried to clothe themselves with their own works, making aprons and fig leaves. That was the first act of religion in the scripture. Religion is man's attempt to reconcile himself to God. That's in verse 7 of chapter 3. And when you get to verse 21 of chapter 3, God replaces those with coats of skins. That's all it said. You don't understand that until you've read the rest of the Bible and come back. What is God teaching them? He will cover them. They can't. He will cover them. How? By the shedding of innocent blood. You can't have coats of skins without shedding an animal's blood. It was obviously innocent. The moral there, the, the idiomatic lesson there, is that God is teaching them, and I believe he in, installed the, the, what we would think of as the Levitical procedures in Genesis 3. Because when we get to Noah, how many of each animal did he take in the ark? Two. Seven. Good for you. Two of the unclean, seven of the clean. And for a lot of reasons, I won't get into all that. How did Noah know? We read that. Wait a minute. How did Noah know it's clean? It's a couple of books later that we find out what clean and unclean is. It's not in Genesis. It's Exodus, Leviticus. What's clean? Those are ritual definitions. Nothing unclean about an unclean animal in the sense of anything other than ritualistically defined as unclean. And yet no one knew that. How do you know that? Because those are taught. They weren't codified in the law until Moses, yes, but that's later. But they were taught in the garden. Now, this is the same answer to our plight, Romans 3 and Romans 8. And I might mention here, you wonder, gee, how do we get this excrement off of us? Because we do it all the time. We stumble, we fall, we roll in the mud. Next week, next month. Remember your Christian's bar of soap. 1 John 1, 9. Because if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to do what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He takes care of that. Now, there is another example. Turn with me to Matthew 22. We should be there if you've kept your thumb there. I meant to warn you. First few verses. Let's just jump into Matthew 22 verse 1 and Jesus answered and spoke unto them again by parables and said the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who made a marriage for his son and he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding but they would not come he sent forth other servants saying tell them who are bidden behold I have prepared my dinner my oxen and my fatlings are killed and all things are ready come unto the marriage But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and treated them shamefully and slew them. You think the host of the feast here is pleased by that? That's pretty upside down. Verse 7. But the king heard of it and was angry. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Ooh. And he said to his servants... The wedding is ready, but they who were bidden were not worthy. Go therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So the servants went out into the highways, gathered together all, as many as they found, good and bad. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man who had not a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou in here, not having a wedding garment? And he was 
speechless. No answer. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him, where? Into the outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Wait a minute, gang. You and I read that, and we're confused. We sort of visualize the guy standing there, Hey, guy, you invited me. See, we don't understand the procedure. This is the days of Christ. And the procedure was the wedding garments were provided by the host. Here's a guy there that doesn't have the wedding garment provided by the host. See, it's a parable, but he's making a point. He's making a point. So this business of garments is a heavy, heavy thing. Now, what we will not do here, just in the interest of time, I encourage you to look at Exodus 28, Leviticus 8. You can study the high priest's garments. It's a fascinating study, every detail of which, in effect, points to Christ. You'll discover that next to his skin was a seamless robe. And you, of course, remember that at the cross, they parted his garments. But there's one thing that was so precious they cast lots for, a seamless robe. And that is so important that Jesus himself describes it as he watches it. But he does that in Psalm 22, 800 years earlier. And you read Psalm 22, it's like it was written from the cross looking down. Fascinating. And Jesus calls our attention to it. His first and last words from the cross are in that psalm. It opens up with, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And goes on through and talks about how he looks down there. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. And of course it finishes with, it is done, it is finished in effect. And it's a fascinating psalm, and we won't take the time here, but I encourage you to read Psalm 22 and recognize, especially on Easter time, that this is his words as if he's describing it from the cross. It's incredible what's included in there. Also, though, I want you to visualize this high priest from the garments in, in uh, the Torah that he had shoulder pads with the names of the 12 tribes engraved on the onyx. And he had a breastplate of gold with precious stones, 12 of them, each one engraved with the name of the 12 tribes on the precious stones. They were engraved on the stones. I want you to remember that. From all that background, which I won't take the time to go through, we're down to verse 5. And next few verses where Christ challenges us as our high priest. Verse 5, And I said... Let them set a fair miter, or that's actually a turban, upon his head. So they set a fair miter upon his head and uh, clothed him with the garments, and the angel of the Lord stood by. Now, by the way, I want you to picture Zechariah. We tend to focus on the vision. He's a young guy, probably a 30 or right about there. That's when a priest starts. And he is involved. I want you, he's not seeing this as a passive observer. He gets so excited, he's participating. Here's Joshua. And they're changing his garments. It says, and I said, who's I? Sarah, he's participating. He's so excited. Hey, yeah, and let's put a miter on his head. He's excited about this. He's getting into the act himself, and they take his suggestion. This is interesting. The word tarban is tanafif. It's a, it comes from a root meaning to wind around. It was the headdress of the high priest. And of course, if you know from your, if you know the Torah, if you know Exodus, on the on that turban there was a gold um, thing. It said holiness unto the Lord. You can see that today. If you go to Israel, go to the Temple Institute, they've made one for the next temple, not to teach or as a museum trinket to actually be used in the coming temple. And you can actually go there and see it. Now, at Yom Kippur in the Torah, all this stuff was done. After the atonement. You see, he couldn't do it beforehand. And of course, the atonement in Yom Kippur is idiomatic of the atonement that occurred on the cross. You and I are dealing here with a love story written in blood on a wooden cross 2,000 years ago. That is the real atonement. Yom Kippur points to that both before and after. But it is after the atonement that this can be done. It can't be done beforehand, the, pay, the payment. Not really, because that's the, the payment's done. And so uh, up till then, it was just a ritual with the linen stuff and so on. Now, it's the Israel nation that's in view, and uh, this is important enough. I'd like you to turn with me to Romans chapter 11. Those of you that would like to really understand the role of Israel in the future, God's plan, Paul, in his definitive statement of Christian doctrine that we know as the book of Romans, spent three chapters hammering away, you know, is God finished with Israel? God forbid. 9, 10, and 11. The climax of this tour de force of Paul's gets up here into Romans 11. Verse 25 is, should be familiar to most of you. Because we all talk about the fact that Israel as a nation seems to be blinded to the real gospel. Jesus predicted that. 
We're going to talk about that when we get to Zechariah 9, when he rides the donkey and so forth. Because they didn't recognize him, he says, now these things are hidden from thy sight. Are they hidden forever? No. Paul tells us how long they're hidden from their sight. And it's in verse 25 of Romans 11. Paul says, I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until... I love that word until. There's a milestone after which they'll no longer be blinded. What's the milestone? Until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. When James, the Lord's brother, in Acts chapter 15, quotes Amos 9 at the Council of Jerusalem, he points out that God in the Scripture, in the Old Testament, says he's going to call a people for his name, the Gentiles. After this, I will return and restore the tabernacle of David and so forth. He's quoting Amos 9. But that's in the New Testament in Acts 15. We've read that before. But let's continue. Everybody reads this verse. It's a very key verse because it implies that Israel will be drawn into their final destiny after the church is complete and taken out of here. After the fullness of the Gentiles be what? Come in. Come in where? Whole another study. But think about it. Verse 26. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away the ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are the enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. Now here, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. That verse is often quoted with respect to spiritual gifts, and it does apply. Don't misunderstand me. But its context is on what? For Israel. The destiny of Israel is unchangeable. They can't screw it up if they try, and indeed they've tried. Some of it they can, absolutely. But their destiny devolves from the fact that they were chosen, and God knew what he was doing. He doesn't choose something he later unchooses. He doesn't adopt somebody he unadopts. You hear of unwanted pregnancies, you never hear of an unwanted adoption. Okay, so what we have here is the reinstatement by the Lord. It's clearly God's work. No help from man here. We have forgiveness, acceptance, and restoration to a position of privilege. And it's interesting, Isaiah 61 verse 10 is a key verse, but in order to keep moving here, let me just keep moving. And uh, God's ultimate plan is for all of his people to be a kingdom of priests. We find that term in the Old Testament, in Exodus chapter 19, where the giving of the law in Sinai is recorded. You'll notice in verse 6, they are to be a kingdom of priests unto unto Yahweh and so forth. That's confirmed in Isaiah chapter 61. In the New Testament, the same term is used of the believer in Christ in 1 Peter 2.5 and in Revelation chapter 1 verse 6, that we, our destiny, is to be a kingdom of priests. Interesting. Now, one of the things you could also do here, we won't take the time, is to study the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we talked about Matthew 22. I believe that parable is idiomatic, of course, of the marriage supper. We talked about that. And the wedding garment issue we just went through. But also Revelation 19, we find. Well, let's let's take Revelation 19. It's too too relevant. Let's just get that in front of us as we finish this this chapter here. Revelation 19. And uh, we'll pick it up, oh, about verse 6. Revelation 19. And I heard, as it were, John speaking, the voice of a great multitude, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of, the, of mighty pearls of thunder, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice, and give honor unto him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in what? In fine white linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Their righteousness, no, his imputed to them by way of the cross. Verse 9, And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they who are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. He saith unto me, These are the two sayings of God. And I fell on his feet, at his feet to worship him. And he said, uh, See thou do it not, I am a fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. And here's a key phrase. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Every prophecy in the scripture is testimony of whom? Jesus Christ. It's a key to understanding prophecy. Here, here underscored. And I saw the heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. 
Make war? Yes. His eyes were like a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. And these are diadems, not Stephanos, like in chapter 6. These are diadems, ruling kind of crowns in the Greek. And he had, on, he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with vesture, dipped in blood. Whose blood? His? No. His was shed on the cross. This blood in Isaiah 63 is the blood of his enemies. And his name is called the Word of God. That's one of his titles, as John opens his gospel with. And the armies that were in heaven followed upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it he would uh, smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. He treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Who? Praise God. Let's move to verse 6 of Zechariah 3. The angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of the armies, or the hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Interesting phrase, the Lord of the armies, Lord of hosts, Sabaoth in the Hebrew. Now it's, it's despite his dirty garments, but because of the new garments in effect, there still remains a call to obedience. Joshua is our representative, or Israel's representative, standing there. He's, he's been changed, new garments, he's got his righteousness. Is it all over with? No. There's still a call to obedience. Service is to flow out of a godly life. You don't become godly by serving him, but if you're really godly, you will be serving him. Jesus said the same thing in John 14, verse 15. If you love me, you do what? Keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. Now, the last couple of verses, God now delivers the high priest. Verse 8, Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Boy, there's a lot here. This hear now, O Joshua, you don't get it in the English. In the Hebrew construction, it actually is very similar to the French, s'il vous plaît. Hear, if you please. It's a command with a politeness to it. Listen, if you will. It's sort of, you know, we don't use that much in our English, but in the French, you will see we play. It's a form of politeness. If you please, in effect. See, we play is the French equivalent. He says, Hear, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows. This is not personal. Here's another clue that this isn't individual, it's collective. It's what he represents. Now, this is, pertains to the nation of Israel in the future. And the Joshua here is emblematic of the Savior that's coming. Because he is going to stand in the place of his people. He's going to be our high priest. Not the Joshua that's there in the vision. It's the real Joshua, the Hoshua, the one we call Jesus, that is in effect the emblem here. It says that, uh, for they are wondered at. That's a little misleading in the English. It implies that those fellows are going to be wondered at. What it really means, they're going to be of symbolic significance. They're going to be... The ones that represent glories yet to come. Not because of what they've done, but what they represent will be glorious. And they will bring yet forth. In other words, it's future. This does not mean, it's not Zerubbabel. Some commentators try to apply this to the local days there. No, this isn't Zerubbabel. This is yet future. And he says, I will bring forth my servant. And boy, just I won't take the time here. That label of the Messiah in the Old Testament goes all the way through. Isaiah 42, 49, 50, 52, 53, Ezekiel 34, and of course in Philippians 2 speaks of the Messiah in the role of the servant. We don't have to badger that one. It also says, my servant, and he calls him the branch. That's a title of Jesus Christ. The word here is tzemek. It's one of 20 words that could be used for branch. It means to sprout out. It's analogous to Isaiah 53. He will grow up before him as a tender plant. Remember Isaiah 53, 1. Now, we're going to discover that this idea of the branch is in at least three or four styles. In Isaiah 4, 2, the term is used, and it speaks of the Emmanuel character of Christ, who will be fully revealed to a converted and restored Israel after the second coming. You'll find that in Isaiah 7, and of course it's highlighted in Matthew 25. But in Jeremiah 23, 5 and 33, the branch of David is the term, and it refers to him as the offspring of David according to the flesh. And we find that in Romans chapter 1 and elsewhere, where he'll be, he will manifest his kingdom glory as king of kingdom and lord of lords, as we've just read. In Zechariah 6, we're going to discover this term, the branch is used again, in the sense of the son of man, the last Adam who's going to undo what the first Adam forfeited. 
And that's in 1 Corinthians 15 and so forth. Where he will reign as king and priest over the earth that originally was under the dominion of the first Adam before he fell. So we have the branch used in distinctive times. Now it's interesting. He is using the term zemek here, which is the branch. And you'll notice these passages have to do in effect with his first advent. You'll also find references in the Old Testament where the branch appears as the root of David, like in Isaiah 11 and so forth, which is Netzer, and it's from that the word Nazarene comes. There's a play on words that he's going to be a Nazarene. He's also the branch in the sense of Isaiah 11 and so forth. Another way to profile this, interestingly enough, the title of the branch is used at least four ways in each of the four Gospels, in a sense. In Matthew presents the branch as he appears in Jeremiah 23. Matthew is a Jew, and he presents him as the Messiah, the son of David, the royal king. Mark has a different orientation. He, uh, he presents the servant, as we will see as it's presented here. My branch, the servant, like in Zechariah 3.8. Now Luke emphasizes the branch as the son of man, and that we'll see that uh, Zechariah emphasizes that in chapter 6 when we get there. And then John, the fourth gospel, presents him the branch as the son of God, as exemplified in Isaiah 4, verse 2. So the branch is used four different ways, which correspond to the four gospels. Now, I'm not trying to be obscure here. I'm just trying to hint at some things that as you understand the Scripture, you, design, you discover it has a conceptual structure underneath the text. And when you become sensitive to that, you begin to appreciate that we have one integrated message from outside time itself. Look at the verse 9. He continues, For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua upon one stone shall be seven eyes. And behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of the land in one day. Whew. Well, the first thing I recommend you do when, you get, when you're in the mood to do this, take a concordance, like a strong, I mean an exhaustive concordance, take the word rock or stone, and notice every place it's used in the scripture. And you'll make a discovery that you really have to do yourself to really appreciate the impact. You'll discover the Holy Spirit uses it consistently. Give you one clue. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4, it speaks of the rock that in the Old Testament where they hit it for water and so forth. It happens twice. That rock is Christ, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, 4. It happened twice. The intention that God had, but Moses didn't quite follow it, was a first one where he, where he smite the rock, and the second one where he, where he just spoke to the rock. And that was supposed to model the first and second coming of Christ, but Moses, you know, screwed that up. From Genesis 3 to Revelation, you'll find consistently. Now this stone is the stone that was cut without hands to smite the image in Daniel 2. You remember Daniel 2, we have the image of all Gentile dominion. The gold, silver, brass, and so forth. And we have the stone cut without hands. Smite the image. And that stone, it's cut without hands. It's a supernatural stone, not cut with hands. And then it grows to be a mountain that fills the whole earth. His government will be established on the planet Earth. That's, what all, that's all laid out in Daniel chapter 2. But that's the stone cut without hands. So we find them there. And we also find uh, the stone is laid in... Isaiah 28 says the stone is where? Laid in Zion. Not in Italy or the United States. No, it's in Zion. He's the stumbling stone and the rock of offense. We find that term used in Romans 9, 1 Corinthians 1, and 1 Peter 2. And he becomes the headstone of the corner. Not in one place, all through the scripture. He's the stone that the builders refused, but he's become, of course, the headstone of the corner. In Psalm 118, verse 22, quoted elsewhere, of course, and on it goes. And I also suggest, in a sense, there might be a link here to the stones that didn't cry out, but we'll talk about it when we get to Zechariah 9. Now, this stone has seven eyes. Boy, that's a weird idiom. Eyes represent omniscience or awareness and so forth, and we see that seven eyes uh, used of Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. The lamb that opens the seals, takes the book and opens the seals. He has seven eyes. And uh, it'll show up in Zechariah chapter 4 again. In Ezekiel 1, all through, and, and so forth. Then we have the strange expression, he will engrave the graving thereof in this passage. The engraving is implicitly in a precious stone. We think of engraving on like a plaque or a gold or something. No, the term here is suggestive of a precious stone being engraved like the high priest's onyx on his shoulders or the twelve stones of the breastplate. What's engraved? The precious stones are engraved, right? And we find this in Isaiah 28, 1 Peter 2, 6. And I could go on and on. It'll be in the notes. How is he engraved? When was our high priest, Jesus Christ, engraved? He was engraved 
on his forehead with thorns. He was engraved in his wrists or hands and his feet. He was engraved in his side. After his resurrection, people seem to be confused and can't quite recognize him until they see what? His nail prints on the Emmaus Road. They go seven miles, have a Bible study, don't recognize him until he gets to the dinner where they insist that he stay for dinner. And he gives out the bread, which is unusual. He's supposed to be the guest. And when he breaks the bread, they realize who he is. Why? Because they saw the nail prints. 